Hey guys, I am going to make an audiobook series. Many of you have suggested me to read the book titled The Female Brain by Luann Brizendine. I hope you will like my narration. If you have any question or suggestion, you can ask me in the comment section. What makes us women? More than 99% of male and female genetic coding is exactly the same. Out of the 30,000 genes in the human genome, the less than 1% variation between the sexes is small. But that percentage difference influences every single cell in our bodies from the nerves that register pleasure and pain to the neurons that transmit perception, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. To the observing eye, the brains of females and males are not the same. Male brains are larger by about 9%, even after correcting for body size. In the 19th century, scientists took this to mean that women had less mental capacity than men. Women and men, however, have the same number of brain cells. The cells are just packed more densely and the men's inched corset like into a smaller scale. For much of the 20th century, most scientists assumed that women were essentially small men, neurologically and in every other sense except for their reproductive functions. That assumption has been at the heart of enduring misunderstandings about female psychology and physiology. When you look a little deeper into the brain differences, they reveal what makes women women and men men. Until the 1990s, researchers paid little attention to female physiology, neuroanatomy, or psychology separate from that of men. I saw this oversight firsthand during my undergraduate years in neurobiology at Berkeley in the 1970s, during my medical education at Yale, and during my training in psychiatry at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center at Harvard Medical School. While enrolled at each of these institutions, I learned little or nothing about female biological or neurological difference outside of pregnancy. When a professor presented a study about animal behavior one day at Yale, I raised my hand and asked what the research findings were for females in that study. The male professor dismissed my question, stating, We never use females in these studies the menstrual cycles would just mess up the data. The little research that was available, however, suggested that the brain differences, though subtle, were profound. As a resident in psychiatry, I became fascinated by the fact that there was a 2 to 1 ratio of depression in women compared with men. No one was offering any clear reasons for this discrepancy, because I had gone to college at the peak of the feminist movement. My personal explanations ran toward the political and the psychological. I took the typical 1970s stance that the patriarchy of Western culture must have been the culprit. It must have kept women down and made them less functional than men, but that explanation alone didn't seem to fit. New studies were uncovering the same depression ratio worldwide. I started to think that something bigger, more basic and biological, was going on. One day it struck me that male versus female depression rates didn't start to diverge until females turned 12 or 13 age girls began menstruating. It appeared that the chemical changes of puberty did something in the brain to trigger more depression in women. Few scientists at the time were researching this link, and most psychiatrists, like me, had been trained in traditional psychoanalytic theory, which examined childhood experience but never considered that specific female brain chemistry might be involved. When I started, taking a woman's hormonal state into account as I evaluated her psychiatrically, I discovered a massive neurological effects her hormones have during different stages of life in shaping her desires, her values, and the very way she perceives reality. My first epiphany about the different realities created by sex hormones came when I started treating women with what I call extreme premenstrual brain syndrome. In all menstruating women, the female brain changes a little every day. Some parts of the brain change up to 25% every month. Things get rocky at times, but for most women, the changes are manageable. Some of my patients, though, came to me feeling so jerked around by their hormones on some days that they couldn't work or speak to anyone because they'd either burst into tears or bite someone's head off. Most weeks of the month they were engaged, intelligent, productive, and optimistic. But a mere shift in the hormonal flood to their brains on certain days left them feeling that the future looked bleak and that they hated themselves and their lives. These thoughts felt real and solid, 
and these women acted on them as though they were reality and would last for even though they arose solely from hormonal shifts in their brains. As soon as the tides changed, they were back to their best selves this extreme form of PMS, which is present in only a few percent of women. Introduced me to how the female brain's reality can turn on the dime. If a woman's reality could change radically from week to week, the same would have to be true of the massive hormonal changes that occur throughout a woman's life. I wanted the chance to find out more about these possibilities on a broader scale, and so, in 1994, I founded a woman's mood and hormone clinic in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. It was one of the first clinics in the country dedicated to looking at women's brain states and how neurochemistry and hormones affect their moods. What we found is that the female brain is so deeply affected by hormones that their influence can be said to create a woman's reality. They can shape a woman's values and desires, and tell her, day to day, what's important. Their presence is felt at every stage of life, right from birth. Each hormone state girlhood, the adolescent years, the dating years, motherhood and menopause acts as fertilizer for different neurological connections that are responsible for new thoughts, emotions, and interests. Because of the fluctuations that begin as early as three months old and last until after menopause, a woman's neurological reality is not as constant as a man's. His is like a mountain that is worn away imperceptibly over the millennia by glaciers, weather, and the deep tectonic movements of the earth. Hers is more like the weather itself constantly changing and hard to predict. New brain science has rapidly transformed our view of basic neurological differences between men and women. Earlier scientists could investigate these differences only by studying the brains of cadavers or the symptoms of individuals with brain damage. But thanks to advances in genetics and non-invasive brain imaging technology, there's been a complete revolution in neuroscientific research and theory. New tools such as positron emission tomography PET and functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI scans, now allow us to see inside the human brain in real time. While it's solving problems, producing words, retrieving memories, noticing facial expressions, establishing trust, falling in love, listening to babies cry, and feeling depression, fear, and anxiety. As a result, Scientists have documented an astonishing array of structural, chemical, genetic, hormonal, and functional brain differences between women and men. We've learned that men and women have different brain sensitivities to stress and conflict. They use different brain areas and circuits to solve problems, process language, experience and store the same strong emotion. Women may remember the smallest details of their first dates and their biggest fights while their husbands barely remember that these things happened. Brain structure and chemistry have everything to do with why this is so. The female and male brains process stimuli, hear, see, sense, and gauge what others are feeling in different ways. Our distinct female and male brain operating systems are mostly compatible and adept, but they perform and accomplish the same goals and tasks using different circuits. In a German study, Researchers conducted brain scans of men and women while they mentally rotated abstract, three-dimensional shapes. There were no performance differences between the men and women, but there were significant, sex-specific differences in the brain circuits they activated to complete the task. Women triggered brain pathways linked to visual identification and spent more time than men picturing the objects in their minds. This fact merely meant that it took women longer to get to the same answer. It also showed that females perform all the cognitive functions males perform they just do so by using different brain circuits. Under a microscope or an fMRI scan, the differences between male and female brains are revealed to be complex and widespread. In the brain centers for language and hearing, for example, women have 11% more neurons than men. The principal hub of both emotion and memory formation or hippocampus is also larger in the female brain, as is the brain circuitry for language and observing emotions in others. This means that women are, on average, better at expressing emotions and remembering the details of emotional events. Men, by contrast, have two and a half times the brain space devoted to sexual drive as well as larger brain centers for action and aggression. 
Sexual thoughts float through a man's brain many times each day on average, and through a woman's only once a day, perhaps three to four times on her hottest days. These basic structural variances could explain perceptive differences. One study scanned the brains of men and women observing a neutral scene of a man and a woman having a conversation. The male brain's sexual areas immediately sparked the saw it as a potential sexual rendezvous. The female brains did not have any activation in the sexual areas. The female brains saw the situation as just two people talking. Men also have larger processors in the core of the most primitive area of the brain, which registers fear and triggers aggression to amygdala. This is why some men can go from zero to a fist fight in a matter of seconds, while many women will try anything to defuse conflict, but the psychological stress of conflict registers more deeply in areas of the female brain. Though we live in the modern urban world, we inhabit bodies built to live in the wild, and each female brain still carries within it the ancient circuitry of her strongest form others. Engineered for genetic success but retaining the deeply wired instincts developed in response to stress experienced in the ancient wild. Our stress responses were designed to react to physical danger and life-threatening situations. Now couple that stress response with the modern challenges of juggling the demands of home, kids, and work without enough support. And we have a situation in which women can perceive a few unpaid bills as a stress that appears to be life-threatening. This response impels the female brain to react as though the family were endangered by impending catastrophe. The male brain will not have the same perception unless the threat is of immediate, physical danger. These basic, structural variances in their brains lay the groundwork for many everyday differences in the behavior and life experiences of men and women. Biological instincts are the keys to understanding how we are wired, and they are the keys to our success today. If you're aware of the fact that a biological brain state is guiding your impulses, you can choose not to act or to act differently than you might feel compelled. But first we have to learn to recognize how the female brain is genetically structured and shaped by evolution, biology, and culture. Without that recognition, biology becomes destiny and we will be helpless in the face of it. Biology does represent the foundation of our personalities and behavioral tendencies. But if in the name of free will and political correctness we try to deny the influence of biology on the brain, we begin fighting our own nature. If we acknowledge that our biology is influenced by other factors, including our sex hormones and their flux, we can prevent it from creating a fixed reality by which we are ruled. The brain is nothing if not a talented learning machine. Nothing is completely fixed. Biology powerfully affects but does not lock in our reality. We can alter that reality and use our intelligence and determination both to celebrate and, when necessary, to change the effects of sex hormones on brain structure, behavior, reality. Creative Italian Destiny Males and females have the same average level of intelligence, but the female brain's reality has often been misinterpreted to mean that it is less capable in certain areas, such as math and science. In January 2005, Lawrence Summers, then president of Harvard University, shocked and enraged his colleagues and the public when in a speech to the National Bureau of Economic Research he said, It does appear that on many, many different human attributes mathematical ability. Scientific ability there is relatively clear evidence that whatever the difference in means which can be debited there is a difference in the standard deviation and variability of a male and a female population. And that is true with respect to attributes that are and are not plausibly culturally determined. The public surmised that he was saying that women are therefore innately less suited than men to be top-level mathematicians and scientists. Judging from current research, Summers was and wasn't right. We now know that when girls and boys first hit their teen years, the difference in their mathematical and scientific capacity is non-existent. That's where he was wrong. But as estrogen floods the female brain, females start to focus intensely on their emotions and on communication talking on the phone and connecting with their girlfriends at the mall. At the same time, as testosterone takes over the male brain, boys grow less communicative and become obsessed about scoring in games, and in the back seat of a car. At the point when boys and girls begin deciding the trajectories of their careers, 
girls start to lose interest in pursuits that require more solitary work and fewer interactions with others, while boys can easily retreat alone to their rooms for hours of computer time. From an early age, my patient Gina had an extraordinary aptitude for math. She became an engineer but at 28 years old was struggling with her desire to be in a more people-oriented career in one that would allow her to have a family life, too. She relished the mental puzzles involved in solving engineering problems, but she missed daily contact with people, so she was considering a career change. This is not an unusual conflict for women. My friend the scientist Corey Barkman told me that many of her smartest girlfriends dropped science to go into fields that they felt were more social. These are value decisions that are actually shaped by hormonal effects on the female brain compelling connection and communication. The fact that fewer women end up in science has nothing to do with female brain deficiencies in math and science. That's where Summers really went wrong. He was right that there's a dearth of women in top-level science and engineering positions but dead wrong in implying that women do not end up in these careers because of lack of aptitude. The female brain has tremendous unique aptitude as outstanding verbal agility, the ability to connect deeply in friendship, a nearly psychic capacity to read faces and tone of voice for emotions and states of mind, and the ability to defuse conflict. All of this is hardwired into the brains of women. These are the talents women are born with that many men, frankly, are not. Men are born with other talents, shaped by their own hormonal reality. But that's the subject of another book. For 20 years, I've eagerly awaited progress in knowledge of the female brain and behavior as I have been treating my women patients. It was only at the turn of the millennium that exciting research started to emerge revealing how the structure, function, and chemistry of a woman's brain affect her mood, thought processes, energy, sexual drives, behavior, and well-being. This book is a user's guide to new research about the female brain and the neurobehavioral systems that make us women. It draws on my 20 years of clinical experience as a neuropsychiatrist. It calls from spectacular advances in our understanding of genetics, molecular neuroscience, fetal and pediatric endocrinology, and neurohormonal development. It presents samplings from neuropsychology, cognitive neuroscience, child development, brain imaging, and psychoneuroendocrinology. It explores primatology, animal studies, and infant observation, seeking insights into how particular behaviors are programmed into the female brain by a combination of nature and nurture. Because of this progress, we are entering an era, finally, when women can begin to understand their distinct biology and how it affects their lives. We all know from experience that women and men can be astronauts, artists, CS, doctors, engineers, political leaders, parents, and child care providers. My personal mission has been to educate interested physicians, psychologists, teachers, nurses, pharmacists, and their trainees to benefit the women and teen girls they serve. I have taken every opportunity to educate women and girls directly about their unique brain-body behavior system and help them to be their best at every age. It is my hope that this book will benefit many more women and girls than I can personally reach in the clinic. It is my hope that the female brain will be seen and understood as the finely tuned and talented instrument that it actually is. Yeah.